My name is Max Goldman. I'm an Arctic Marine Ecologist with Audubon, Alaska, I'm based here in Anchorage. Um, I most recently have been working on uh, large data synthesis projects, so collecting a whole bunch of data from, let's see, collecting people's data that have already collected the data. So we don't do any on the ground research at Audubon, Alaska. We collect researchers in a lot of ways, and we do a lot of spatial ecology, and I'll talk a little bit more about what Audubon Alaska does. Um, but what we, we work on is essentially um, trying to translate science to a general population in a way that still maintains the, the rigor and is still valuable to the scientific community. Uh, that's a, we've, we've realized that our audience base is pretty broad and appreciate that, so we try to maintain some of that. And so I'll kind of get into some of what we do specifically at Audubon, this most recent project, which uh, this is the ecological atlas of the Bering Chukchi and Beaufort Seas up here. Feel free to, to take a look. And then there's some these cool little USB drives that you guys are welcome to also that have the atlas preloaded on them. And uh, sign and sheet also, if you guys want to hear what we're up to, we won't bombard you with memes, but we will tell you when we're gonna be doing, we do a lot of map exhibit presentations. We did a concert with uh, Sassafras at 49th State Brewery, and bird quiz, so if you're into bird trivia, look no further. Um, so let's see, we'll start out, we, we talked a little bit about Audubon, Alaska, and I'll introduce myself a little better. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, uh, markedly far from the Arctic, um, at, at least this go around. There, uh, I, I played baseball and went to college at Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos and then moved to Prescott College um, where I finished my uh, bachelor's degree and I actually came up here as a, uh, an eco-league exchange student to uh, Alaska Pacific University just uh, across the street um, for a semester which was um, informative, a really, a really turning point. Um, Prescott College and Alaska Pacific University both really impactful on me as a, a student and as a uh, future ecologist they were uh, really excellent opportunities to get the to get to well get to know people who do this for a living which is sometimes can be a hard thing to do I, I remember my first courses in biology and ecology as I'm sure most of you do where I didn't know if there was a path that was outside of academia for biologists and for for scientists I didn't know really what what the options or the opportunities were. And so that being able to get out into the field and meet the huge variety of people from, you know, people who work for agencies and work as range managers and natural resource specialists and people who work for nonprofits and work in conservation or who teach in the huge number of ways that that can look, which, you know, from environmental education and preserves to, to you know, daily school and elementary schools and middle schools and all of the the things in between and this huge number of jobs and, and the huge number of people who have backgrounds in science and how that can inform what they're doing. That was really useful. Being able to get into the field was something that sealed the deal for me because that was, you know, as a kid, you kind of still want to go out and play. I don't think that ever really goes away. I hope not. Um, from there, I, I uh, worked as a field tech, which is a job that you can get pretty easily if you have a background in biology and you have a little bit of field experience, come on in. Um, so what that looks like for, for are, are there students in the, the audience at all? Yeah, and then maybe on, on the camera. So I'll try, I'm trying not to be boring, tell you guys that you, you don't already know, but those jobs are really interesting, especially if you're not 100% sure where you wanna go or if you don't know necessarily what discipline you're interested in. Um, if you graduate with a degree in geography or, envi or environmental science or biology or ecology or some variation um, therein, working as a field tech is a really interesting thing to do. You can, there's a ton of jobs available when you have that background. Um, there's a couple of resources that are really good. Uh, the Ornithological Societies of North America has a job board that's really useful, um, if, especially if you're into birds for temporary seasonal positions like that. Um, and so does uh, Texas A&M. Their wildlife job board was one I used a lot. I'm sure there's more since I've had to look at that, but that was really fun and also got gave me an opportunity to travel a lot. And there's a lot of people who just do that for their whole lives. That, that'll be their career, they'll work. They'll get four seasonal jobs in four different places at three months at a time, and they'll rotate those four jobs for a long, long, long time. And uh, that's 
you know, a really interesting way to, to work in science. Um, I was lucky enough to get some jobs in some cool places. I got to go to South Africa for about eight months studying uh, marine foraging in Chakma baboons, where we basically just walked with bab a troop of 50 baboons that are <coughs> as close as you and I are to each other. They just thought we were really boring baboons. They get used to you and they just thought we're not, we're not like hitting on anybody, we're not eating anything, we're not fighting anyone. This is the most boring baboons possible. So we just would walk around, carry a stick with you because the, the, the sub-adults and the females and the juveniles would use you as a barricade when the males would come after them. And so I remember they told me, the guy I was walking around with this guy named Matt Lewis is an incredibly smart and nice guy, but so like happy it's almost you can't be sure if like how what he would be like if there was something he was being serious about he just it was always really friendly and kind of jovial so he's like oh well and when a baboon when an adult baboon comes just hold the stick out and you'll be fine and it's like this is a hundred pound animal that's stronger than any two men with four inch long canine teeth running at you like oh rather watch you do it the first time <laughs> before i give it a try and sure enough they just are confused that you're not running and they sit down and forget what they were doing and go about their business. But we did that, so we walked around with them. The, the study, the point of the study was to look at um, these specific baboons are the southernmost primates on the planet, and they use limpets and um, some uh, other low tide marine forage as, as food uh, when it's available. And they have an incredible sense of when the lowest tides are gonna be there. There's a visual barrier, so there's a, a huge hill and this uh, Cape Peninsula Preserve, which is at the Cape of Good Hope. So they can't actually see the tides, but they'll just be going about their day and all of a sudden just bomb over this hill and go straight down and it'll be incredibly low tide and they'll eat, pry these limpets up with their bottom teeth, you know, all, all butts in the air and, and teeth on the rocks and uh, eat them until this tide starts to come in and then they go back up and take a nap. But it was really interesting. So the, the point was essentially every 10 minutes as a field tech, we'd stand there and we'd survey the troop for 10 minutes and we would, so every 10 minutes we'd spend 10 minutes looking at sex class, age class, what their activity was, if we knew what their food was, we would survey that. And then when they were marine foraging, we'd do that every minute, um, as long as we could. And those data were to build an activity budget, essentially to find out how do these baboons stack up in the amount of energy that they're taking in and the energy that they're expending relative to baboons that don't use marine forage on a regular basis to see is make them lazier because they've got better caloric intake, does it make it so they have more energy, so they cover more ground, what are the, the main takeaways? And that's still ongoing work, um, as all good science is. Um, anyway, so then moved through a lot of different field tech jobs, um, Wyoming, um, and then I ended up in south, southwestern Colorado and uh, worked on a master's degree at Colorado State University in avian recolonization after wildfire, which is also markedly not Arctic. Um, I, I was in Mesa Verde National Park, and uh, that was really interesting work. And then from there, moved into working with uh, uh, birds in various ways. And then the oil spill happened in 2010, and I went down to the Gulf of Mexico and worked on what's called oiling rates, which is something that was developed up here after Exxon Valdez, which is a way of trying to quantify through the food web what the impact of oil might be in a really short-term way try to project what those impacts might be without the 30 years of data that's really required to do a robust um, examination of, of those impacts. And so what you do essentially is you look at certain species of birds that interact with the marine scape, but that are also easily found and aggregate or colonize in, in large um, groups in the Gulf at this time, they would just be down there likely wintering once we got really got it, got to them. Um, so there were breeders, some of the actually breeders up here and we'll get to that most seabirds are um, did that for a long time um, met my wife doing that worked for a, a company a nonprofit out of Maine called the Biodiversity Research Institute which they do it uh, the, the man who started that is a guy named Dave Evers he does a huge amount of loon work all over the world a lot to do with bioaccumulation of mercury and and things like that but also just behavior stuff um, so worked that there and then I uh, decided we had a little boy and uh, we wanted to go somewhere new. And so we 
we I applied for a job with Audubon Alaska to do a bunch of writing for them and that ended up turning into this atlas um, so I managed this project which was a two-year-long project uh, this is the second iteration of that of this atlas and I'll kind of get into that atlas a little bit more and tell you really what it is on a day-to-day -day basis that we do and what arenas we're working in at Audubon Alaska and what our projects are now um, and that sort of stuff here, here in just a minute. So, um, and but if you guys have questions while I'm talking, that's fine, just, just raise your hand. It's, it's not, I don't have anything memorized or anything. You're not gonna mess me up, I hope, any more than I will myself. So Audubon Alaska is, we've been around, this is our 41st year, so 2017 was our 40th year, um, working in conservation in Alaska, and we are under the umbrella of the National Audubon Society, which I, I think probably most of you guys have heard of. Um, it's a, a really big and long-standing conservation organization here in the U.S. Um, over 100 years uh, they've been around. And they've got lots of chapters, so that's they're, the bird clubs, kind of, the Audubon chapters are a big deal. There's five of them in Alaska, and those are all volunteer, and anyone can join. I recommend if you're into birding, join Anchorage Audubon. They're really, they're a, they're a really cool um, group of people, and we do a lot with them. But we're the state office, so there's 24 of the states um, in the United States, of which there are 50. Um, just to remind us, there's some geography students <coughs> around, just make sure we're all on the same page. I have a state office, and so we're a, a full staff with a bunch of full-time staff members, and, uh, and most of those, other, I'd say tw all 23 of the non-Alaskan state offices, they work with private lands, even the ones in the West, just because that's what the, the landscape is now, is the majority of, of most states are, are privately managed lands, um, and if they're not, they're, they're set aside in a, well, in, often in a pretty robust way. Um, in Alaska, that's not the case. I think something like 65% of the, the land mass in this state is managed by non-private entities in the state or the feds in some, in some um, fashion. And so what that means, when you pair that with just the huge, the enormous size of the state of Alaska, you can if we fight the same battles for a really long time because a small win means a ton of acres conserved. You know, there's a there's a the opportunity to have a big impact, and there's also the counter of that, which we're feeling a little bit now, which is the the risk that huge swaths will be made available to development or will be managed in a way that, as a conservation organization, we don't we don't uh, deem as wise. Um, so we work with birds, of course. We're Audubon, John James Audubon was a famous uh, uh, documenter of bird um, phenology, painted, painted a lot of bird pictures, and that's how they started with the bird clubs. But also with other wildlife, um, we also do a lot of work with vessel traffic mapping and um, energy extraction uh, mapping and forecasting and predicting um, um, various things and using a lot of other people's work and combining those things together. And so that kind of leads us to these synthesis products. Um, and that this this product, which came out last summer, um, is a big 340-page document with uh, eight chapters that covers everything from physical oceanography through the lower trophic sphere to fishes to birds and marine mammals, and then into human uses. And at the end, we make some some recommendation um, in a conservation summary. And so I'll kind of dig into what that what it takes, what atlas making really is. Um, and then what the kind of skill sets that are needed and that'll sort of become clear as you guys listen and uh, the first question I guess is why you would do that um, why we map the Arctic seas and the, there's a lot of good answers to that um, just wanting to know is has been a, is a burning human question that we've asked ourselves for many many years um, but the big reasons for us and the reason that this was a priority now it, and has continued to be a priority. As I said, this is the second time we've done this, is because it's in peril. There's a lot of changes that are happening right now. Um, the area that we covered is the, the Beaufort, Chukchi, and then the whole Bering Sea um, down here. So in the first iteration of this atlas, we stopped basically um, right around here, south of St. Lawrence Island. And in a, the reason for that is in a lot of, of ways, the, this, part of the Northern Bering Sea is more similar to the Chukchi Sea. So those systems interact in a, in a way that, that's uh, reminiscent of each other. And so we, we decided to include those as two, as, as one single thing. So the Chukchi up to the Beaufort, um, not, and then stopped at the Alaskan border and 
did not go into Russia at all. And then the second time, we expanded quite a bit. We expanded into Western um, Canada, and Eastern Russia, and then included the entire Bering Sea to uh, through the Aleutian Island chain. Um, we did not include uh, anything in Prince William Sound or the Gulf of Alaska, just because those are, are really s different systems. We wanted to kind of encapsulate what is impacted by that seasonal ice. That's a really unique component of of Arctic ecology. I mean, a big difference really between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere at the poles is the southern hemisphere is land surrounded by ocean and here it's really ocean surrounded by land. They're, those systems interact very differently. Sea ice acts differently and I think there's a net gain in uh, recent years of sea ice in the, in the Antarctic. It does not compare. I think globally we're still have lost something, a huge amount, but it, it does not make up for what's been lost in the Arctic by a large margin, but and I don't remember those numbers. So the area is really interesting, but it's also with that, sea, that seasonal sea ice component, it's really variable, and climate change is changing a lot of that. There's also some drilling that's happening, vessel traffic as that ice diminishes has changed quite a bit. It's also home to a huge amount of the wildlife that exists in, in this part of the world and really just in, in North America in general, but that doesn't exclude Asia um, either. It's a, a ton of stuff. I think 40, 40 million seabirds, um, and that's individual seabirds, um, nest in Alaska, and that's just Alaska. That doesn't include the Russian or Canadian parts of our, our project area. And that's 75% of all of the seabirds, of every single individual seabird, that spends time in the United States breeds in Alaska. If you include Western Canada and Eastern Russia, that goes up to 82% of the, the seabirds that spend any time in North America, anywhere from the southern border of Mexico up north. 82% of those individuals will breed in Alaska or were born in Alaska. It's incredible. It's really an, or Alaska or Canada. An incredible amount of the um, avian life and that's true also for mammals. Two million uh, marine mammals um, live here, and they a lot of them migrate. Uh, a lot of them use uh, the Pacific Ocean at different times, and will move to uh, parts of Asia, um, Northern Asia, um, Russia, and then Korea, as well as Japan, some in China. But there's huge amounts of pinnipeds, um, also a bunch of whales. You know, ice seals and walrus are, are the obvious ice-associated mammals, but northern fur seals will haul out on on ice, um, stellar sea lions have been known to be found on pack ice as well. So it's a, a pretty incredible area. And like I said, stuff is changing a lot. This shows uh, a projection, um, or a, a, the amount of change from averages between 81 and, and 2010 and 2014. The bright red is nine degrees um, difference in Fahrenheit, which is a, a huge difference. So for those of you who've uh, done any, any work on uh, ichthyology or fish ecology, the difference in one degree can mean a species will totally abandon an area or will fail as a breeder, which you can imagine the ripple up and down effects of uh, you know, those communities leaving an area. This is a projection that we did that, that shows kind of what that forecast of change will look like in 40 years. Um, so this goes forward. Um, the maps on your right uh, show the forecast of change. The maps on the left show kind of, they show the actual temperatures um, in, it's a projection, it, it sort of has to be a projection, and I won't get into that, but um, they show what the temperatures basically are now. And then on the right, it shows the number of, of degrees Celsius that that would change in the future, um, is it, what it's likely to change to in the future if the models for, for climate change, the conservative models for climate change are true, which uh, they actually might be underestimating in a lot of ways. So the benefits of an ecological atlas are to make data useful and accessible to a bunch of people. Um, I mentioned some of the user groups we want. As a conservation organization, we want people in policy making decision, in decision making um, <coughs> positions to be really well informed and to know, and to have been chosen by people who are really well informed. And so putting this in front of policymakers is something that we think is really valuable. That, only is a, uh, an option when we have access to policymakers. That changes as the tides of politics change, which we 
like to think that we impact by making these these data and the science available to the general public and putting that making it available online for free and handing out USB drives and talking to people about Arctic science, um, giving a lot of a lot of talks, and then we do a bunch of bird walks and as much outreach as we can, try to shake people by the collar to get them to pay attention to what's going on. But we've always been of the um, mind that informed voters make for future excellent managers of, of our public public lands. Scientists are also a big uh, user group of this of these atlases. And we learned that when I was going back to collect the data, get updated data for this atlas. Um, I, just, I guess I sort of assumed that most of the biologists who do work um, up here would go to the primary literature for uh, when they wanted to know what bowhead whales were doing in the summertime, they'd go to the primary literature. That could take a long time. And so what we learned was that they really use that first atlas a lot. And you're in an Arctic Council meeting and the topics can shift from sea ice margins to king eiders to beluga whales to ice seals, being able to have information or being able to reference off-discipline information in a quick way was really valuable. And so we wanted to, that informed for us the level of detail that we wanted to leave in. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a point of diminishing returns where you have to simplify things to make it clear, but there's also a, a layer that we didn't want to simplify past to make sure that the important messages and some of the really telling components of the most recent and the most current biology were still tucked into those pages. And so that was a, the way that we were able to do that was by, through a huge amount of review and dealing with and talking with biologists at every step of the phase, including peer review at the end, and then overall review by, by Boehm and a bunch of other folks. Um, so that was, by realizing we don't know everything was really the best way to get at that. Um, so then we wanted to develop a, a picture that, that was more descriptive of the entire area um, for the species and the ecosystems, physical processes and biological processes, and hopefully to inform planning and decisions. And that's uh, to be seen, but um, you know, we think if being able to move the needle is one of those things that's really hard to track, um, but that's one of the, the main goals of what we do is to, to have some recognizable changes in the way that people interact with, view, and manage um, Arctic marinescape and the, the Arctic in general. Um, and also because we hadn't done this in five years and in those, I guess, seven years, and in those intervening years, neither did anyone else, uh, a lot had changed. I think the first sentence in that first atlas um, from 2010 was that we know more about the surface of Venus than we do about the um, seafloor in the Chukchi Sea. And that's changed in this, those seven years, the amount of data that's been collected by agencies, by UAF and UAA, by the Oregon State, huge amount of researchers from all over the, the country and the world um, has added to our, our you know, complete knowledge of the Arctic in a huge way. And we have a long way to go, but the growth in data, has, it was, a, was, a incredible, was just incredible. This is the first page of the Atlas. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna go through it one page at a time. Uh, I mean, unless you guys are good for a few hours, I mean, I'd love to do it. No? No? All right, fine. You're lost. Um, I like this page because it shows the depth of collaboration that this, this uh, project took. Um, we worked really closely with Oceana on this. They were the stewards of the lower trophic and fishes data in the Atlas, and they are in the project that we're working on now, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Um, all of this was funded by the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, um, and they're still funding a lot of Arctic work. Some of, that's ours, some that's a bunch of other folks, but they've got a huge Arctic program that's really successful and impressive. Um, we also worked with Kowarik, who is the um, nonprofit um, arm of the Bering Strait region's native communities. So they represent the tribes in the Bering Strait region. We used traditional knowledge that they had gathered on their own in 2013 um, and made into spatial um, data. So they made maps of all of that stuff. And so we integrated those data into our atlas um, by way of access to the spatial data and then also workshops with um, experts from, subsistence experts from nine of those tribes uh, a year ago this month and then a ton of review afterwards. And so we were, this was a, a pilot project for us and we, there's a lot of things that I think Kawarik would want us to do differently in the future and that we would do differently, but this was some, a way in, in our mind of, of taking into account the entire way of knowing 
that exists in the Arctic and ignoring the people who've lived here for millennia uh, seems like a pretty short-sighted way of trying to understand these processes. So we are of the, the mind that the best way to learn something is to ask somebody who already knows, and that seems to have hold, held true so far. Um, we also worked really closely with agencies, Fish Wildlife, USGS, um, BOEM, which uh, we were really proud of the, the, um, their contribution, that they were willing to contribute and that they took an interest in our product. I think it says a lot about them as an organization, especially in the Alaska region, and we were really proud that they saw our work as, as of, of enough rigor and of the, the um, caliber that they, they wanted to make those final tweaks to make sure that we had it exactly right. And they did, they helped a lot. Um, and then we, we hired a cartographer for this, so a lot of the reason that these maps look really good is we don't necessarily, we have a lot of, of GIS um, capability in our office. That's something we put a lot of, of energy towards. Do we have any people um, here who are interested in GIS or have worked with geographic information science? It's, uh, there's a, do you work with GIS now? Uh, not, no. There's, are you a student or are you? A graduate student, yeah. So there's an interesting, if you know of any other folks who are, are working with GIS, uh, tomorrow um, there's a, and I'll, I'll put it up on our website, but there's a, um, the Summer of Maps in Philadelphia, they are um, hosting a paid internship for a GIS fellow for the summer. And uh, it's a really cool program. They, we're, su we're submitting a project, is why I know about this. So a bunch of different organizations from city planners to conservation organizations and everything in between submits projects and then the interns get to choose what they want to work on. And so they can kind of decide. And so if we have to hope our project gets chosen by an intern. Um, <laughs> but it's a really cool program in a really interesting way. So if you know of anybody else, you know, pass that along and I'll, yeah. I'll make that stuff available. But um, we hired a cartographer for this and the design component of this product was is a big part of the accessibility, which is a, a big component of what we wanted to do. Make this stuff available to everyone also means that it, they have to be able to look at it and understand what you're talking about. And while we, as we've been very close to these data for a long time, might be able to look and I can tell you what paper a polygon came from, that does not necessarily help uh, you know someone who doesn't have a broad understanding Arctic science, dig into that and get something meaningful out of it. So the chapters were um, chopped into physical setting, um, which is, is sea ice, ocean currents. Um, we talk about climate and physical setting. Biological setting is our lower trophic chapter, um, zooplankton, benthic biomass, crabs, um, primary productivity, uh, fishes, which are, you would imagine, you've seen them, we've all seen them. Um, so these are, we didn't, do a comprehensive inclusion of every species that exists in the Arctic because that would be amazing and would have taken a lot more than two years. Um, we chose a, it's a curated list of, of uh, fishes, of birds, and of mammals especially. Um, and we chose them for a lot of reasons. Some because of commercial viability, some because there's a lot of data. Um, it's hard to map something when you don't have a lot of information about it. Some, for in the case of Osmorids or, or uh, uh, forage fishes because of their inordinate impact on ecosystem function. You know, without forage fishes, the the whole food web is is it's not a web. 